Stewart's Conversations podcast. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Conversations Interpreting and Translating podcast. I am Fatih Karakas, your host. And I just wanted to tell you that today is the last episode for the year 2020. And I'd like to thank all of you for supporting us throughout this very, very difficult year. And I'd like to also thank my guests for their time and their expertise. And who else but to finish the year off with uh, Dr. Miranda Lai, who is definitely not a stranger to our podcast. Her episode on vicarious trauma went viral um, and uh, was one of the most streamed episodes of our podcast. So we thought we'd bring her back (laughs) and finish the year off with a big bang. Dr. Miranda Lai, thank you so much for agreeing to come and talk to us again. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you so much for inviting me again to finish off the year. And hopefully we have a better year ahead of us. Indeed, indeed. And I think things can only get better after what we've gone through in 2020. We hope so. Indeed. And um, things are, for Australia at least anyway, are looking uh, promising. Um, and we hope that uh, hopefully the rest of the world uh, also catches up to that kind of promising level. Um, so well done to everyone. We have done so well um, to get here. Um, look, uh, today uh, we are with Dr. Miranda Lai. She is the co-author of the book Ethics for Police Translators and Interpreters. Make sure you get yourself a copy of that book. Um, co-authored that with uh, the late Sedat Mulayim of RMIT University. So a uh, big hello to Sedat as well uh, today. Um, so we're going to talk about ethics regarding police translating and interpreting. Uh, so what is it that makes police translating and interpreting uh, particularly special, especially within regards to interpreting. Why is the police discourse so special, Miranda? And and why is it that every time we get uh, one of these jobs, we're always shaking before we go? I suppose it's probably because, to start with, I mean, we go about our daily lives. We don't really cross paths with police every day. You know, you and I, you know, we talk to each other quite often, but then we don't talk to the police that often. Every time when you talk to police, and particularly in the context of criminal justice, it's always a bit nerve-wracking because someone is in trouble, I suppose. That's basically what it is. We don't deal with the discourse on a daily basis. And by the same token, I suppose, when it comes to court interpreting, the same thing. If we don't end up in trouble, Hopefully, we'll stay away <laughs> from the court. Yeah. So I, I, I guess it's really an issue of being familiar with police discourse. And of course, the more you are familiar with the this particular genre, if you like, the more you are able to perform well. In terms of um, the, the, the specialty or what, uh, why it is so special about police discourse, I suppose um, it is peculiar. It's a peculiar genre, if you like, that it is a mixture of lay language, a bit of jargon from the police that they always use, and then a bit of a mixture of legal language. So part of it, it's nice and easy. Um, If you imagine that the police officer, when they question, question someone, they might just try to um, establish rapport. How are you doing? Um, I am here to help you. Um, I want to understand what happened so we can get to the bottom of something. That's perfectly normal, just like our daily conversation. So that part might be fairly easy, but then when it comes to the time that they use their jargon or if they use legal language, For example, if they arrest you um, to question you about something as a suspect, 
they have to read you you are right the police caution you mm. you don't need to say anything but anything you say or do will be used as evidence this is kind of legal language so a mixture of everything that makes it somewhat peculiar if we could put it that way um well Within regards to police interviews, what are some of the characteristics? I mean, do they use particular techniques mm. uh -huh, um, uh -huh. when they're interviewing, for example, that uh, we should be aware of? The most important thing I normally point out is really, if you think about it, the power imbalances between the questioning police officer and the person being questioned, the suspect. So the power asymmetry. Um, the manifestation of power asymmetry, um, if you think about it, really is the power to hold the floor of your speech act. The person with more power in the dynamics would always have the right to ask a lot of questions. So in the context of police interviewing, police officers, they would always ask you questions. And can you ask questions? Very rarely. You, as a suspect, have the obligation or been a less powerful person in that dynamic, you have to answer questions. So being an interpreter in that situation, you really have to understand that sort of dynamic and the power asymmetry in the situation. And then you can kind of predict questions always coming from the police officer and then answers always from the person being interviewed. That's one of the most... Um, distinguishing, if you like, characteristics of police interviewing. Um, so how is how's an interpreter supposed to be dealing with a situation like that when you have something starts with a, quite a conversational kind of a way, you know, building rapport, and then mm -hmm. things start getting a little bit more intense, um, mm -hmm. and then you have this power play, you know, powerful versus powerless. Mm -hmm. Should that come across in the interpreter's uh, tone as well? I mean, what do you recommend there? Most definitely, um, I'm sure people in the audience would be very familiar with the Aussie Code of Ethics. And then when we talk about um, the concept of accuracy, according to the Code of Ethics, we don't mean just um, conveying the words or the content of the utterances. You also have to try to relay the tone of the police officer if they are being oppressive or if they are trying to be friendly with the person being interviewed or um, on the other hand um, the suspect being interviewed if the answer comes out kind of very hesitant or very confident you as an interpreter you have to be able to relay not only the content but also the tone the intent we say um, in your interpretation Therefore, coming back to what I was referring to, this accuracy concept, according to the Code of Ethics, we do have to keep in mind that accuracy, it is a broader concept rather than a very narrowly defined, oh, you know, I have to convey every word and I'm done with my interpreting mm. duties. No, it's not like that. Okay, so we said that um, there was some legal jargon being used. There was a, you know, the police discourse was a mixture of, everyday language, uh, lay language, as well mm -hmm. as some legal uh, jargon potentially used. So what are some of the linguistic challenges an interpreter can face during one of these interviews? Mm. They will be quite a few. So I'll give you just a few examples here. Um, say, for example, um, scholars in the interpreting field always advise us that when you do interpreting, you need to pay attention to, um, be careful not to edit anything, not to summarize anything, not to delete or you know, do anything that are not in the original message. So that comes back to what we were talking about, this concept of accuracy. So say, um, um, I gave an example in the webinar that, mm. you know, there is an incident of road rage and then the police officer asks um, the victim, oh, what did the guy do? Um, the guy who was in the car who cut in front of you. And the victim says that, and this example, by the way, is from our book. 
the book that you mentioned. Anyway, so the victim says that, oh, the guy came out from the car and he had the thing in his hand, you know, the thing that, um, that we used to change wheels. And then he threw that thing at my car. Now, as an interpreter, um, you can interpret it exactly as what the person says. But then the example we gave in the book is that the interpreter says that, oh, the guy came out from the car and then he had the wheel brace in his hand and he threw the wheel brace at my car. This is what we call you as an interpreter, you edited um, the victim's utterances. If you think about the content or the meaning of the utterances, I mean, the way the victim describes it and the way you as an interpreter using the precise term, meaning wise, there really isn't that much difference. However, as an interpreter, like we say, you should avoid editing anything. The victim says he used the thing to throw at my car, the thing that we, we used to change wheels, say it that way, rather than using the precise term, wheel brace, yeah? Um, another example I use in the webinar that say, uh, people ask you, um, uh, or police officer asks the victim, oh, how are you getting on at work? The suspect says that, oh, they are giving, they are giving me a pay raise next month, okay? As an interpreter, this answer doesn't directly answer uh, the police officer's question, how are you getting on at work? Therefore, um, the interpreter's response becomes, I'm getting on really well. In brackets, why? Because the interpreter thinks that the suspect says that they are giving me a pay raise next month, therefore I'm getting on really well. The utterance coming out from the interpreter becomes, I am getting on really well. Again, this is editing, or you can say that this interpreter adds something mm. to the answer, which we advise against. No, please do, please do not do it. Whatever the suspect says, convey it. The um, questioning police officer can infer from whatever the answer, or if the police officer doesn't get the answer he or she wants, what can they do? As long as you transfer it faithfully, they can follow up with yet the next question in order to get to the bottom of whatever their question is. That is the way to go. In, in your research, does it happen often? Like the interpreter takes charge of the content and edits because they think it answers the question better? I mean, you've done obviously research on this. Does it happen that often? Um, that's, a very, that's a very good question. However, I'm unable to answer you. <laughs> Reason being, police interviewing, if anything, unlike court interpreting, where most court cases, we are able, you and I are able to attend court to observe and to collect data. Mm. Whereas police interpreting, what happens? It happens behind closed doors. Therefore, it is extremely difficult to get authentic data. Most of the research um, I've done, at least in my own case, it's all experimental. Okay, You set up some sort of experiments and then you test how professional interpreters deal with mm. various situations or various um, syntactic structures or various expressions used by police and then you kind of try to understand what happens when language mediation um, happens. So that is a challenging bit in terms of doing police interviewing research. And that brings me to, um, I'm jumping the gun, I just mm -hmm. want to seize the opportunity to remind people in the audience that, like I say, Police interviewing happens behind closed doors. Therefore, it is important for us interpreters, interpreters to understand that in a courtroom, you've got the umpire being the judge mm. up there to make sure that everybody sticks to the rules, the rules of the game. You ask fair questions, the 
um, the respondent, be it the suspect or whoever or a witness, can answer the questions, but everybody sticks to the rule. Whereas behind closed doors, there are normally two police officers asking, uh, interviewing someone. Good and cop, bad cop. Exactly, yeah. Therefore, scholars have pointed out that it is even more important of the presence for an interpreter to be there. Why? Because those people who are unable to effectively or efficiently communicate with um, these questioning officers, it is very important to rely on the assistance from the interpreter because there's no one there to help you mm. um, in the interaction with the questioning officers. Unlike in a courtroom, you can rely on all the players in the court to ensure that it goes fairly. Yeah? So it is important for us interpreters to understand um, the nature of police interpreting. You being there, it's even actually, actually even more important than in a courtroom. And therefore you need to be able to perform really to the best. Um, that, look, that's that's amazing recommendation. Now, uh, we, we did a, a, a little survey, if you remember, in the webinar. Uh, by the mm -hmm. way, those of you that haven't watched the webinar, um, Dr. Miranda Lai was kind enough to present a webinar for conversations, interpreting and translating mm -hmm. on this particular topics of ethics for police translators and interpreters, which you'll find a link for in the description of the episode. Um, and we did a survey there and it was South Bank versus uh, South Yarra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we said, you know, if the suspect said South Bank, but you actually knew the answer should have been South Yarra, would you change it to South Yarra? Would you keep it as South Bank or would you ask for uh, clarification? And um, there was 7% that said that they would change it. You know, and uh, so, you know, there, there, there could potentially be interpreters out there just, just in regards to the evidence um, that uh, that uh, could be seen. Um, yes, so there, there could potentially be interpreters out there still who would change the content mm. by the sound of things. Precisely. So the point is that, you know, our talks are fraught with imperfections and mistakes mm. because we are not when we talk sometimes we are thinking about oh what am I going to have for my dinner therefore I say something inadvertently incorrect yeah or something when you hear it as an interpreter you know that it's factually incorrect so do you correct it do you not do anything about it or what do you do so the advice is that in that situation, in a police in interviewing situation, you have to convey, again, faithfully, whatever you know that you it's factually incorrect, convey it. And then what happens? Well, the police officer, if they, they hear that, and if they want to sort of follow up with that, they can come back and then, oh, did you mean South Bank? Or did you mean South Yara? And then as an interpreter, you convey it back. That would be the best policy. Well, I guess it's it's important to know that sometimes I guess the police are looking for errors and pushing for errors even, and exactly. then when you when yeah. you start correcting those errors, it kind of defeats the whole purpose of them uh, asking that particular question. Perhaps that's, that's one right. to think about as well. Uh, look, we spoke about the linguistic challenges. Thank you very much. What about some of the paralinguistic challenges uh, or non-linguistic challenges? Yeah, again, there are you know various and many. So, say for example. Um, I mentioned in the, again in the webinar that we as interpreters have to try or refrain from prodding, um, particularly the load speaking mm -hmm. clients in the sense that, yes, indeed, I mean, most interpreters do the job because we love it, because we want to help people who do not speak English in Australian context. Now, if the police officer asks a question that you know the person is not really answering the question. Do you prod the person and say, answer the question? You cannot, don't just nod, okay? So the police officer might ask, um, you know, were you in the pub last night? The person might just, you know, shake his or her head. And then you know that it's been recorded. And as a very experienced interpreter, you would say to the, uh, the person, don't just nod, say it out loud. Do you do that? No, you, you don't do anything like that, yeah? Whatever um, 
you, we have to keep in mind that the situation or the interview is controlled by the police officer. Mm. It's not you. Therefore, do not try to prod your um, non-English speaking client just because you think that they are not answering the police officer's question. Whatever they say, convey it. They might be some important information there that the police officer can get and then mm. ask follow-up questions. And that might open up a completely new lead for them. So who are we to decide that this is not in response to the question you just conveyed? It's not for you to decide. You know, convey the answer back and then the police officer can follow up with whatever the following question or they can ask any question. That would okay. be the recommendation. Thank you. And uh, like, like yourself, I've um, been to a few of these interviews as an interpreter mm -hmm. and uh, I, I found it quite challenging at times when uh, things get a little bit intense, um, especially the load might get a little bit uh, out of control. They might get a little bit angry and, uh, you know, sometimes they're on the other side of a glass, but sometimes they're in the same room as you. I also find it very stressful mm. as well because you have no idea what's, what's going to happen next, you know. Um, there could be quite a lot of profanity thrown around. Um, I mean, I find it very, in, in a way, you know, you need to switch from one character to the other. You're asking as the police and, you know, you have to be that powerful person and then the answer comes back and all of a sudden you have to be a powerless person and or, or you have to you know start swearing and acting all kinds of in ludicrous ways as as the non-english speaker is acting i mean is that something that you recommend like staying in character for both of the parties or do you kind of like try to stay as neutral as possible in order not to add any more fire or gas to the fire you know um i suppose i've always thought that we as interpreters are to some extent, like actors. Of course, we are not as dramatic as actors. However, um, to some extent, we might be using our voice to be to kind of act out mm. um, the police role and also the non-English speaker's role. I would say that, you know, you try, like we say, you not only have to convey the content of whatever they say, you also have to try to relay the tone, the intent of their utterances. Um, therefore, it's a quick um, flipping between, like you say, you know, a more powerful police questioner and also a um, less powerful um, person, non-English speaking person who um, is being questioned. Um, you kind of go in and out of different roles as you see, as you see fit. And that's, that's our job. So um, I don't see any issues in them. Of course, you do not try to be more dramatic than and then, you were. Maybe than not them. get too carried away. Not, not no, too much method don't. acting. No, you a don't. Bit but then, down acting, yeah. Exactly. But then you do have to, to some extent, relay the emotions, mm. the, um, like we say, the tone in whatever they say that is a must you know you I try you you try to help them understand the context the, the communication context they are in that that is a must that's our job that's yeah, our responsibility i think so too i think so hmm. too so like you said the content is important intent is important and the intensity in that case as well precisely. is well quite important precisely um and to touch on that uh i think it's quite important in my experience and uh, according to my learnings as well um it's quite uh, important to do some kind of a professional introduction and set down your protocols before you begin. Mm. So when you are acting like a policeman or you're acting like the non-English speaker, um, so they, they kind of expect this from you. They expect you to be almost in a way copying their actions or their, 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 the tone of their voice. Um, mm. Because, I mean, again, in my not so experienced days where I wouldn't have done a professional introduction uh, you know, I would have, especially from the non-English speaker going, why are you copying me? Oh. You know, why are you acting like me? Mm. So I've mm. started adding uh, in, the, in the professional introduction, I'll be interpreting everything that is said the way it is said. You know, and, That's an and, excellent idea. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was really helpful, especially for um, the, the cold client who hasn't probably had a lot of experience with interpreters. You know? mm -hmm. Or um, they might have 
experience in other contexts, you know, in a yeah. hospital or in a, you know, social welfare context. However, not very experienced in a um, police context. Therefore, yeah, that sounds very, very helpful if you are able to give them a bit of a, a introduction or briefing just so that they are, you know, they put their mind at ease that you are just trying to do your job. Um, look, I don't want to catch you off guard here, uh, mm. but I think there's been some research done on this as well. Uh, especially for legal interpreting, uh, for court interpreting, not so sure about police interpreting, briefings. You know, as interpreters, we have no idea what we're walking into. Um, you know, we go there and you probably only find out the last 15, 20 seconds, at least with when you're wait, waiting in a hospital. Um, let's say you didn't get a lot of information from uh, your agency or, or the institution you were going to, you're able to have a bit of a briefing with the patient. You're able to have a bit of a briefing with the doctor, even if it's a walk and talk. I find that when you go to a police station, first of all, well, the non-English speaker, you can't really get a briefing from them. They're somewhere there on the other side of the screen. Um, and the police officers, they, you know, you don't really get any information until that very last minute of you walking into that room. They don't, even within the walk and talk, there isn't a lot of um, agreement from the police officers to give you information. And, you know, as, as I think all practitioners out there would agree that uh, preparation and knowledge and briefing is one of the most important things. Is there any kind of work being done in, in, in your experience or, you know, do you know of any work being done for, interpreters to get a little bit of a briefing at least what the topic's about i mean it could be they could say that it's domestic violence um or give a little bit of a summary not necessarily so much detail but a little bit of a summary of what we potentially might be walking into exactly yeah no that's such a good question i suppose um in the legal field particularly for court interpreting um with this national standards for yeah. um, working with interpreters in tribunals and courts, um, this set of national standards has been very helpful in the sense that it advocates for us interpreters that when we go for a court case to interpret, we need to have materials for preparation so that we do a good job. So that is kind of already on the way. Yeah. The next step is for us to push harder um, to extend the um, call for preparation materials beyond court cases. You know, like you say, uh, when we attend police stations, um, sometimes I kind of understand that this thing has just happened. They just napped someone and chucked the person in the cell and they need someone to come immediately to interpret for the person. They might not even know precisely whatever is the case. I understand that. But again, as interpreters, when you attend the case, at least I suppose we should, we should have the we should be assertive to ask the um, police officers in charge before we go in to ask them to set aside time to ask them what the case, as much as they know, what is the case about, and then allow you a bit of time if yeah. you need to go online, consult a bit of materials to just prepare yourself before you go in. I think we should um, advocate for ourselves to get that sort of briefing, even if it's on the spot. Better still is um, cases where it's not, you know, it's not like it happened five minutes ago when they make um, bookings with interpreting agencies. It's a mutual thing that interpreting agencies should work towards insisting or asking, always asking for case briefs. I mean, we don't need names, we don't need, you know, dates, you know, all those, uh, mm. all the detailed information, we don't need it. We just need what the case is about. Just yeah? give us some context so we could do some preparation. Precisely. All we want is we can do some preparation so we can do a good job. So I think it is very important for um, interpreting agencies to also understand where we interpreters come from and then insist, mm. I use the word <laughs> intentionally, that we do need to insist um, with um, the 
police forces, when they make bookings, try as much as possible to get, you know, as much information as possible, as much information they feel comfortable. Well, at the present moment, they probably don't feel comfortable giving you anything. Anything, but if we push, if we push as Precisely. practitioners, as language service providers, and, you know... Um, Everybody work. This being part together. of all graduates as well, and we had a yeah. chat with the all graduate CEO about this, and there is going to be hopefully some push for this in the Precisely. new year. But Precisely. I think what, what you say is right. You know, academics like yourself, um, practitioners, language service providers, um, if, if we all push for this, I think uh, they will finally give in <laughs> and, and, and it will mm -hmm. happen. But if we if we get too scared and, and, and like we said, you know, interpreting in a police setting can be a little bit scary because scary. we don't have a lot of interaction, interaction. with the police usually. And, and another point could be some countries where we might come from, police can be something that's completely different to the police over here, okay, without naming any countries or cultures, you know. Uh, police can be uh, quite scary and it can, it can bring up some quite traumatic experiences perhaps yeah, even for interpreters. Right. So they might not even have the courage to ask for a briefing and just let's do a quick in and out kind of a thing, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah. I think it's very important. Like you said, uh, a, a very good example is I was in, a court, I was in the court and then I quickly got called over to the police station, which is linked to the court. And they said, oh, we want you to just do a quick interpreting. Um, someone's remanded. Uh, and just can you just come and interpret quickly? Mm -hmm. You know, and I went there and uh, I think it was my probably my first ever police interpreting. Um, and I wasn't ready for it. I was scared. Um, the the non-English speaking client was also uh, not in a very comfortable position. And, you know, they weren't making it any easier. And, and, yeah, it, it did probably stop me from doing any more police work for the next few weeks after that. Um, uh, so I think it's super right that you say, even if it is on the spot, on demand kind of a job, you know, to, to find the courage and say, look, we have the right to a briefing. Yes, I am coming. I'll help you out. But quickly tell me what this is about and then give me five minutes, number one, to mentally prepare. Exactly. You know, and then number two, we've got our phones on us all the time. Maybe I can do a little bit of research, some terminology, and then get myself ready into that headspace and then be a good interpreter for you as opposed to just take me in, throw me in the deep end. And even the best of us, I think, in a situation like that would find it very challenging. Exactly. I think in terms of the preparation side, we've said um, quite clearly um, that's going to help us in terms of our preparation. Um, our performance. You mentioned something which is very important. Research has actually shown that when you go into a, um, an assignment, whether you are mentally prepared or not, it actually has implications. It actually has impact in terms of whether you are going to be traumatized. Hopefully mm -hmm. not. Yeah. So particularly because we don't know what we are going to be faced with when we go in to interpret. Some information about the case that you are going to be confronted with, mentally prepare yourself before you go in to interpret. It is so important. Having that mental preparation will guard you against possible vicarious trauma if it's going to be traumatic. So that is a very important message to share with our audience that yes, indeed, you know, um, have the courage to ask. Mainly, of course, we say that so that it can help you in terms of your linguistic performance, but mentally it would also help you to protect yourself, um, not to be, you know, hopefully touch, touch on wood, it wouldn't uh, mentally scar you. But then if it's going to be some sort of traumatic content, you go in, um, with some mental preparation that is very important. I think it's important to point out here that it's another expertise area of yours, vicarious trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, thank you very much for that recommendation too. So you're saying that if we are, uh, let alone contextually prepared, but if we're mentally prepared, the chance of us uh, getting vicarious trauma actually reduces or the impact <laughs> is reduced. So exactly. even if it's just for that purpose only, we should get some kind of preparation some kind of briefing yeah. it is important yes all right well very good thank you very much um look just to wrap things up any other recommendations you would have for interpreters and translators who are uh practicing in this um, niche Field. area mm. yeah 
Um, I suppose, I mean, there is no particular tips or anything like that. Again, it is for us to understand this particular work context. Um, the better you understand it, the better you will be able to perform. Therefore, um, try to read up on, say, you know, what police forces, what do they do, so that, you know, you then know, okay, um, if it's a, you know, home break-in or if it's a, you know, human trafficking or, mm. you know, whatever case, the more you read about uh, what police um, forces, what their responsibilities are, then you can sort of expect that your future police work will fall under one of those, you know, lines of duties that they cover. Um, that's in terms of your contextual knowledge preparation. Um, guarding against vicarious trauma is very important. Therefore, um, I think, like we say, we need to be assertive. And when you go, when you go for every single police um, assignment, be um, be sure to get you know briefing, like we say, just so that you go in with your with your um, mental preparedness, with, with mental preparedness yeah. um, before you go in. So that's also important. Um, very good. Thank you so much for your time today. No uh, it was such a pleasure talking to you. And uh, mm -hmm. again, thank you for being my last guest for the year. Merry that's Christmas to you and your family. You. I hope that you have an amazing 2021. Um, it's everybody. not going to be too high of a bar after 2020. And I know how it has been, how difficult it has been at uh, RMIT, like with all other universities as well. Um, so on behalf of uh, all the students and teachers out there to all of our um, teachers in all the TNI institutions in Australia, thank you so much for all the hard work that you have put in this year. Um, and I think, uh, you know, with a click of a finger, we went from teaching face-to-face -to, -face to teaching online and it was still business as usual. Um, thank you and your team and everyone else out there in the TNI teaching field um, who was able to adapt so quickly uh, to what's been going on out there. Um, thank you everyone out there for your support through 2020. Um, we've hit 23 episodes in 23 weeks. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll do a whole lot more next year. Um, so we're going to have a little break uh, for the next couple of months, and uh, we'll be back uh, early March with uh, more guests. Um, in the meanwhile, if you have any topics that uh, you want covered or if you have anyone in mind that you'd like to see get interviewed, um, please just drop me an outline. My email address is party at allgraduates.com.au. Um, we do have a webinar uh, for ethics for police translators and interpreters as well um, that uh, Dr. Miranda Lai uh, presented. Uh, and you can find um, the link to that uh, in the description, as well as in our website, conversationsinterpretingandtranslating.com.au. Um, now, please follow the YouTube channel, subscribe, like, um, as well as uh, any other uh, way you get your podcast, whether it be through Apple, Google, or Spotify. Um, it's available in all those channels as well. Uh, anything that you've missed, you can always go back and catch up on those episodes. In the meanwhile, have an amazing holiday season. Uh, those of you that celebrate, have a Merry Christmas. Those of you that don't, that don't enjoy the, uh, the time off, as I'm sure uh, it was well-deserved for everyone. And um, we hope to see you again in the new year. And thank you again so much, Dr. Miranda. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All Graduates Conversations Podcast.